Uh, thank you all so much for watching the Furious Flower Facebook Live series. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, Furious Flower is um, the uh, poetry center at James Madison University, and it's the nation's oldest academic center dedicated to Black poetry. In the 25 years since the first Furious Flower Conference and the 15 years of the center's brick and mortar existence, Furious Flower programs have reached thousands of poets, educators, students, and poetry lovers around the world. From groundbreaking media, to anthologies, to summer seminars for educators, and decade-defining conferences, Furious Flower has impacted literary communities on local, regional, and national and international levels by creating platforms for Black poets to encounter their readers and for the readers to experience and engage, and, and engage with Black literary culture in a new and exciting way. And also, uh, this Facebook Live reading series is made possible by a grant from the National Endowment of the Arts. So thank you so much to, to the NEA. And now I'll introduce myself. Hello, everybody. I am Nathan Kwekujan. I'm a second year MFA student at the University of Michigan in the Helen Zill Writers Program. Uh, I'm of Gambian and Ghanaian descent. Uh, I'm a finalist for the 2021 Brunel International African Poetry Prize, uh, honorable mention for the Furious Flower 2020 Poetry Contest, and a finalist for the um, 2020 Plowshares Emerging Writers Contest. I have work that is uh, published and forthcoming in The Common, Obsidian, and Sunu Journal. And I'm also working on my first poetry manuscript entitled Saltwater Demands a Psalm, where I investigate colonization, black mourning, um, politics, and especially the consequences of climate change in West Africa. And lastly, my chat book, Birth Elegies, is forthcoming in 2022 with Finishing Line Press. Uh, so I guess for my reading this afternoon, I, I wanna take folks on a bit of a journey. Um, I'm currently in Ann Arbor, which is like uniquely resistant to spring. So I thought that I'd begin with some poems that take place from the beaches of my homeland, Gambia. Then we'll hop over the Atlantic for some poems that take place in the US. Uh, I'll share some elegies and other poems and we'll finally end on the beaches of Ghana with our final poem and also end with a poem about dance. So here's our first poem. Somewhere along Fajara Beach, the Gambia. The prickly smell of just caught tigerfish makes market. Even the fisherman's catamaran quits in time for supper. Sunset football match, upkick sand freckles the eye just long enough to chorus a blink. Thatch palm umbrellas speckle the coast, ebet red, yasa yellow. Mother's Forlorn High Tide. Uh, this next poem is titled Almond Joy, and it centers a scene of black men and boys playing soccer, again, on the beaches of Gambia. And it's based on many childhood memories that I have with uh, playing uh, soccer on the beach with my cousins, my dad, and my uncle. Here is Almond Joy. The sun ruffles our blankets through the mosquito net's pulp. We know which floor tiles to avoid in the scramble to dress for a Saturday of football along Fajara Beach. We never cook breakfast before our games. Instead, we walk to the closest Ahmed shop and grab two bars of almond joy, protein, fruit, and, el and energy, all in a single bar. Then a five minute walk along Atlantic Avenue to the beachfront. By the time we arrive, low tides prepared a flat canvas of sand. Never any cleats, just the conjure of beach sand between black toes. Uncle Matt whistles and go! It's 10 v 10, no goalies. Two conch shells demarcate each goal. With dad to my right, I make a cut through the middle of the field and he threads me the ball between a defender's legs. I cushion it with the outside of my foot. I'm best at this holding. I surge goalward with the ball still sticky on my feet. My sprinting charms a silkscreen of sand. Uncle Matt scrambles to man the goal, but I boot the ball low with the outside of my foot. He freezes, 1-0. We play well into the mid-afternoon. 
as the sun barks its bleeding scarlet. During haphazard half times, we rushed to the water to freshen our feet. The tide rises, we shift our field. The sun finally dips as most of the beachgoers make their way home. But our final game has only just begun. We flower long into sinewed shadows. Our sand retains the memory of this dancing. In the moon-fed dark, our ears sharpen to discern the whir and thwack of the ball. After a day of playing, we've memorized the inflections of each other's panting. I know my father's breathing well, and his footsteps also. I close my eyes as he overlaps my run. We pace toward the goal, matching strides, trading the ball with each other. I slot it into the goal, but keep running as the ball surges to the waterline. We all dive in after it. We dive in after it and whisper a final time into its granule etched skin. We allow it to taste the ground swells and the riptide. The ball ebbs toward the horizon, our offering to the clutch of salt. This next uh, poem is dedicated to a memory that I have with my aunt, who was a talented hairstylist. And uh, growing up, I have so many memories of her coming over to do my younger sister's hair. And to make myself useful, um, I was asked to burn the tips of the braids uh, whenever she would do the box braid hairstyle. To sort of, and that's like the technique that folks use to preserve the ends. Uh, here is burning box braids on East and 94th, Tulsa, Oklahoma. It is my job to burn the tips, to singe them with the torch of a 99 cent Texaco lighter, and then dunk each lock into a bowl of tap water. The flame licks its way up each braid before sputtering. Auntie Mari blows out each little fire, obliging me to uphold my end in the production line of Yazzie's still tender, still kinky hair. This act, me sitting cross-legged, on our grainy carpet, sprucing Yazzie's hair, Yazzie just above me on her favorite lima green kitty stool, Auntie seated just upright on our yad sail couch above Yaz. Whispering little secrets to her, I will never quite know, will never quite hear. All the while, a mix of shea butter, coconut, and blue magic sweetens the sticky fumes of burning synthetic hair. Auntie recites Yazi's favorite Kweku Nancy story yet again, revealing the tale's climax just as she loosens the toughest kink. We practice a kind of rebellion in strange land. Her hands marry, birth, and bury, lacing together a family tree, spinning psalms, spells, and people, plating trinity. In our quiet hands, fluid and flame still speak. This next poem is also about hair, and it is called Dwafe. And Dwafe is a Ghanaian um, adjective symbol that symbolizes like hair care and hygiene. A new proverb. You can tell the age of a comb the same as a human. Check to see how many teeth it's missing. May your hair charm the teeth of each comb it meets. May you collect the broken teeth of every comb your hair charms. And when you have at least a handful of charmed teeth, may you fashion them into an anklet. With more, make bracelets, even necklaces in due time. Please season your jewelry with emerald and ivory from the troves of Oboise. Keep and grow these gems of your hair's hunger. A song made new. Make note of the day your hair takes a new prisoner. Keep this record with a distinct marking on your jewelry. You'll need it to recollect time once you reach the dissolution of days. All right, this next poem, uh, well, it takes a phrase that you probably heard if you grew up in most black households, and that phrase is good air. Or more specifically, don't let out the good air. You know, if it was cold outside, that meant you better not leave the door open or else all the good air in the home, all the warm air would go right outside. And vice versa, if it was too warm outside and the AC was on, you best not leave the front door open. 
Uh, so this poem remixes that idea and, and that phrase. Good air for my sisters. Today we gather at the mouth of the Brooklyn Bridge to pray the names of the just dead. Brianna, Oluwatoyin, names cradled and vaulted to air, but after air, where? Water has perfect memory, but air? Black woman's wisdom cautions against letting out the good air. There is no manner of telling what type of air is waiting to hex you beyond your doorstep. My mother, an air tender, kept the air within our home good. The goodness of this air is measured in equal parts, plantain oil, lemon pepper, cinnamon, cocoa yam, blue magic, African royale, black soap, black castor oil, black. Don't let out the good air because good air is fragile and finite. Let in too much outside and it's liable to spoil. Before I moved out, my mother, the air keeper, hurried to bottle as much of our good air as I could carry. She spiced the living room thoroughly, culling the mango warm fragrance of photo albums and Polaroids, the cola tang of Fela's zombie, the lilac of Whitney's Whitney. Then, with all the trimmings of her best hair, honed and humming, she pirouetted, clutching an open mason jar in each hand. After seven complete whirls, she rushed to date and seal each jar. And again, again, again. Now, whenever I leave home, though I carry my weight in her air-toned jars, still my mother pleads, don't let out my good air, meaning hurry back in, meaning Black girls have gone missing so swiftly. People turn to blame the air. This next poem is actually inspired by my uh, late grandfather who went to be with the Lord. Uh, and he also wrote poetry. Um, he was born in Sierra Leone and would tell us stories about uh, how abundant diamonds were in the regions, especially the riverbanks of Kono. And Sierra Leone has alluvial diamonds, uh, which means that they're closer to the surface. And basically during the rainy season, um, oftentimes the, the, the banks would get flooded and the diamonds would now rise to the surface. So children and people would just like pick up the diamonds and use it to decorate the walls of, of, of their homes. This is before obviously colonization and the unfortunate uh, blood diamond um, basically the blood diamond fueled civil war in Sierra Leone. Freetown ring. Also for this poem, it's important to note that the word tubab is just means white people. Before the tubab came, children would decorate their bedroom walls with sugar rock from the rivers of Kono. During the big rains, silt banks gulp then burst with grainy water, inviting these shine stones to creep from their passing hamatan sleep and soar coming to bloom in season like the cassava and the cola and the cotton trees. Who then could have known that these alluvial trinkets would one day draw blood? If only the rains had known, they would have skipped their song for a season. If the river sands had known, they would have hidden the radiant litter. If only the children had known. All right, so this uh, next set of poems are actually from a series of elegies that I wrote uh, for victims of, of police brutality in the US. Uh, but these elegies incorporate elements of the um, Ghanaian Akan naming system. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, I was born in Gambia, but my mom is from Ghana. And in Ghana, they have a naming system where children are given soul names or kradin based on their day of birth. So because I was born on Wednesday, my name is Kweku. And this name means more than just your day of birth. It also uh, imbues you with a certain set of characteristics, right? Uh, so for example, people who are born on Monday are supposed to be wise. People born on Wednesday are supposed to be tricksters and so on. Uh, so for these poems, I give a, um, a con names to these victims of police brutality here in the US that correspond to their day of, of birth. And I wanted to do this to sort of refract the tradition of naming ceremonies and answer the question of what it means to name someone uh, after they've passed. Naming ceremony. 
The day of a child's naming is their real birth. We whisper water into their weak old ears. Yaka se insa, aka se insa. When we say it is gin, untruth, say that it is gin. Yaka se insu, aka se insu. When we say that it is water, truth, say that it is water. Water has perfect memory and is forever trying to get back to where it was. To hours parted by salt water, parted by flood, it's time again for birth. Our elegies refuse to kill again, it's time for birth. Sankofa. It is not taboo to fetch what is at risk of being left behind. There will always be risk in leaving. There will always be risk in fetching. In fetching, your neck might bend like the palm tree in storm, but I am the egg nestled on my feathery back. Turn back. Fear no flames. Fear no salt. I am. I am Sankofa. Turn back. Uh, and this first elegy is for Trayvon Martin. And uh, like I said earlier, like for these elegies, I really wanted to focus on the forgotten aspects of their lives. And for one of them, um, Trayvon Martin, uh, his, what, one of his dreams was to become a pilot, and he actually attended space camp, you know, which um, during his early teens. So this is a poem inspired by that history, celebrating his life. Kwasiada, for Trayvon Akwesi Benjamin Martin. Kwasiada, 1995, to, to Kwasiada, 2012. I named him Akwesi, whom you also call Trayvon. My week's beginning, my worship, anointed, yellow, new. My week begins with flight because he prayed to me only, let me grow old enough to be my own pilot, to fly my own skies. Each night I painted his eyelid interiors, cerulean and whisk. He saw himself boarding the latest Airbus A350 in crisp first captain digs, a deep navy coat and slacks overlain with bulbous gold buttons, three gold stripes on each shoulder, three gold stripes on each sleeve. His silver aviation wings are pinned squarely just left of a slim lapel above the crease of his, best, of his breast pocket along with the Jacksonville Jaguars pin because this year will finally be the year. He'd nod to the, to the head flight attendant and give his co-pilot a close tuck dap before announcing some recycled yet heartfelt banter over the plane's PA system, speaking coolly for all to hear the tenor and water of his South Florida drawl. Black boy pilot, keeping black boy skies. Even during turbulence, he'd measure the water in each cloud. Steer, measure, steer, tilting heavy wings through nesting cloud water. My week leads open without its beginning. Uh, this next elegy is for uh, Sandra Bland, who um, actually growing up was a trombonist. And uh, she attended Prairie View A&M and was a uh, star trombonist for their marching band. And this poem is inspired by that story. Memenada for Sandra Annette Ama Bland. Memenada, 1987, Ajawada, 2015. Ama played the trombone, the only wind instrument and harmonically identical to human voice. The only wind instrument and harmonically identical to her voice. Ama played the trombone, sung its brass to gold. She belted up a storm with the Prairie View a and marching panthers doused in purple and gold. Her trombone kept her water, especially after the two-a-day practices before opening day or homecoming, when the horn section honed its high-stepping, filing and refiling into pristine rows. Her horn kept her water, funneling sweat, coaxed from her lips by the South Texas sun through a globby mouthpiece. It kept and carried her air, viscous from perspiring lungs through her silver mouthpiece, through her aching horn. It kept and carried all this water in the horn spit valve until its brass airways gurgled. She'd knowingly punched the water key 
allowing her water to pulse out, arcing long as the arm slide of her con Selmer trombone. It was impossible to get it all out. After a decade of use, fine films of water glazed the horn's interior, such that Ama could not voice a note without just a little water speaking too. Ama, Ama, the first name of God, air to water, water to music, music to air. When we say it is water, say that it is water. Kani din, kani din, say her name, say her name. This last elegy um, is for Tamir Rice. And uh, this was one of the most difficult ones to write because obviously he was so young uh, when he was murdered. And um, this one centers on the fact that growing up, you know, he was known to be a lover of painting and he would attend after school programs where he would paint and sculpt and just be able to manifest his joy as every child should be able to. Uh, so this poem is inspired by um, Tamir Rice's love of painting and, and art. Ebenada, for Tamir Elijah Kwabena Rice. Ebenada, 2002, to Kwasiada, 2014. Death is not a way to forget, but to remember. Time gone, body time. Kwabena loved painting with watercolors, naturally, being born the same day as the ocean. He painted my watercolor best, daubs of azure tempered with a counter melody of silver, just enough silver to mimic my lucence. Then he'd add pockets of butter yellow, reflective morsels of sunshine. Then with a snow tip brush, he'd render my bubbly froth. Because the art stores in West 80s often ran low on watercolors, or because the art stores in the West 80s neighborhood long left West 80s, sometimes Kwabna would whip up his own watercolor. Mixing four tablespoons of baking soda, cornstarch, and white vinegar with half a teaspoon of corn syrup. Then a few droplets of food coloring to complete the elixir. Add more than half a teaspoon of corn syrup and it'll turn too thick, less like watercolor and too much like blood. He ran Samaria's pantry dry, making my watercolor. But in the time it takes me to wrinkle a wave's translucence onto shore, he was still all water has perfect memory. All water has perfect memory, especially snow. I birthed in his skin watercolor and welcomed him even in that fledging snow. When we say it is water, say that it is water. And that refrain, when we say that it's water, say that it's water, is actually taken from uh, something that's said during naming ceremonies in uh, Ghana. All right, so this next poem is actually going to be about dance. Uh, anyone who knows me knows I love to dance. So I'm going to get the um, poems uh, before my reading started. Uh, so this next poem is about a Nigerian dance called the Bese. And the Bese is a type of Afrobeats dance style where you basically have to jump in the air and do a roundhouse kick. So it's a very full body dance. And this poem is a celebration of that dance. Bese. A reprise of bodies leave the ground together. Sweat wet Ankara, weaves steaming at their seams, heads with oil slick fades, brown skin limbs finely buoyant. At Zlatan's guttural call. Bese, Bese, Besolie. This Yoruba sings sweetest when chanted together, but it is nothing without our bodies also lifting, whirling our knees like we're stirring a pot of egusi. Then we soar into Bese and dare each other. How long can you remain dancing when all that's beneath you is air? Uh, and this next poem is about the barbershop. You know, with the pandemic, I've had to learn to cut my own hair and sometimes it's been good, sometimes it's been not so good. So this is a shout out and sort of an ode to uh, all the barbers out there who leave their clients uh, feeling a lot more confident going out than they did going in. 
uh, barbershop philosophy. A regular walks in with tales of the weekend still quick on his lips, interrupting talk of sport and size. The whole shop devours it pulp and pith. Okay, so the young blood think he got game now? Man, y'all should have seen me back in my day. I was the baddest cat in the city. Like clockwork, Baz offers the same retort, vaunting his days of dark haired glory. Our recontour bows to whooping ovation, then sits. The sweet whir of jabbering clippers makes quick work of his mane, sifting closer and closer to scalp and skin. He submits, silenced as this rough, well-practiced touch tenderly thumbs across his forehead, brushes over his cheeks, cools his throbbing temples. Man, you got the same old kinks as your father. How he been doing? The barber speaks into the mirror where the two share a tacit game of peekaboo. Then tilting the shop chair back, the barber guides our storyteller's head to rest on the knoll of his gut, applying keel's foam to make the supple the bristle of neck, then jaw, then chin, inviting the blade to lift each stern follicle slowly. Our storyteller braces himself as a prickly mist of rubbing alcohol startles his shorn skin, followed by cotton dabs of coconut oil along his hairline and silken throat. After the final snick and lacquer spritz, the barber shakes off the apron, now frothy with coil clumps of hair. He gives our storyteller a hand mirror and begins to tidy his tools, allowing the young man to play in his pretty, angling the mirror this way and that before returning it, snapping back. He steps down from the shop's plush seat and pauses to give his barber a customary close tuck handshake. Marveling yet again, the two nod in gentle gaze. And now it's my second to last poem. Um, as promised, we are back on the beach with a poem entitled Saltwater Demands a Song. And the speaker of this poem uh, is a local fisherman who laments the presence of large fishing corporations along Ghana's coast. Um, unfortunately, uh, many European and American fishing corporations overfish along many West African coastlines, including Ghana's, uh, thus threatening the livelihoods of such local fishermen. Uh, so here is Saltwater Demands a Song. Jamestown Beach, Accra, Ghana. The moon's gray whisks morning waves. Groundswells glide and trade this silver snakeskin for sunrise. And we're up, my crew and I, we've been up. We've counted the wind, traced the tides, combed and poured over our nets, nursing any tangles or weathered gaps. Our boats wait ready styled in electric hues, names like happiness, good luck, nyamidria, and big catch are branded onto their still banked hulls, waiting at the heels of palm trees. We come to shore singing, clapping, humming, salt water demands a song. We owned a measure of earth's edge and thunked with the tide chasing it during each morning catch before the barges came before the big barges came and scraped our reefs clean. We now vie with, with them for the final fish. It's a butterfish. We haven't netted any guitar fish or sandy grouper in months. It, it has to be a butterfish. They've been our village's anchor since when I was a child learning to fish. I asked my father if the water below us was dead. He said, the water is only as dead as the bodies beneath and alive as the bodies above. He reached down, offering a palm full of salt water. We both drank, swear to keep this balance. These aren't the first ships coming to starve us and, and they won't be the last. Even our butterfish knows this and he's merciful. He's promised that we won't even have to catch him He'll come to us grinning and prideful, and we'll scoop him into a bucket of salt water and bring him with us back to shore. We'll feed him and groom him, trimming his airy whiskers. 
We'll dress him up in purple kente like an ohene. We'll make festivals in his honor and name our children thus. And the day he passes, we'll round up the village families and lead them with us to sea. And with our boats, we'll blockade all the barges and bury our last butterfish with no casket, no pyre, just salt water and a song. And now my final poem, right on time, uh, is gonna be a poem about joy and dancing. And it is called Adinkraheni, which is named after the Ghanaian um, Adinkra symbol for charisma. Adinkraheni. And the greatest of these is joy, joy divine, joy unspeakable. Black joy circles, black joy ellipses. See how black joy circles, especially at functions, kickbacks, and cookouts. See the giddy eyes when the fir circle first constellates. Who will break from the valence to make our circle's nucleus? Who will become our first son? Someone yeses the beat. We usher our first son into the eye of the circle. Go, go, ay, ay. She stitches guara to zanku. Energy, body rolls into leg work, slows into a jiggy bop. Zanku, zanku, seasons her shoulders with pop locks hits the folks, freezes, winds into a shoki ki shoki, then bese, our sun implodes and scatters this first circle. See Black Joy's plasticity. A new circle metastasizes. Now a second sun strives to test the charisma of the first. The two circle each other. Sometimes they mirror each other. Sometimes they window each other. Give it to them, yo, yo. They remind us that the body is a prism of rhythm. That whatever sound enters a black body never leaves unchanged. Our songed sons make sculptures of time. See our animate shrines. See our lyric full bodies. Time come, body time. Thank you. Let me see what's happening in the comment section. I've been reading to myself the past. 30 minutes. Wow. All right. So I think now the rest of the time is for questions and questions in the chat. And first, I think I'll answer my own question, <laughs> which is how did you first hear about Furious Flower? And I first heard of Furious Flower when I was an undergrad at the University of Virginia. And I was taking a class with uh, Rita Dove. At the end of, of the semester, she told me about you know all the readings and conferences because like I was like I was like where can I tap into more black black poetry? And she told me about it, and that's how I learned about Fierce Flower, which is like an hour away or two hours away from like where I went to undergrad. Sadly, because of the pandemic, I have not been able to visit, but I can't wait to visit the center and attend the conference once everything is back to normal. Um, I think I'll also recommend. What am I reading right now? Uh, that's one of the questions that I was asked before the reading. I'm currently reading uh, Lucille Clifton's How to Carry Water. You can see it there. And yeah, that's been really inspiring my work lately. Like, she's just such a master, you know, I think of the image, of the metaphor, and so much of her language is so unique. And I try to mimic that in my own poetry. Uh, let's see what else, any other, because I know that my speaking is like ahead of what y'all can hear, so. I'll also answer some more questions. Let's see what else we got. Uh, oh, what has been my most um, dramatic encounter with a poem? I think that basically the poem that inspired me to even want to write poetry or pursue a degree in like black literature uh, was Melvin Dixon's uh, tour guide, La Mazon de Esclavas, which is basically uh, a poem about his experience visiting one of the slave castles in Senegal. And it was so vivid and visceral that like I, I cried after reading it. And that was one of the things that keeps inspiring me um, to write as well. And I think, yeah, I'm still waiting for any questions from the audience. I'm reading all of the, um, I'm reading all of the uh, comments and make me feel very warm. So thank you so much. Uh, I'm so happy to be able to share poetry, and even though so everybody's all over the place, it was it was, it was lovely to share this time with you folks. 
So as I wait for more questions, I'll go ahead and read that poem by Melvin Dixon, which is probably one of my favorite poems of all time. Which is taken from the anthology of African American poetry, which is like probably my favorite <laughs> book of poetry. I've had it for maybe like three years now. All right. Tour guide, La Maison de Esclaves, Ile de Gore, Senegal, Melvin Dixon. He speaks of voyages, men traveling spoon fashion, women dying in afterbirth, babies clinging to salt dried nipples. For what his old eyes still see, his lips have few words. Where his flat, thick feet still walk, his hands crack into a hundred lifelines. Here, waves rush to shore, breaking news that we return to empty rooms where the sea is nothing calm. And sun, tasting the skin of black men, leaves teeth marks. The rooms are empty until he speaks. His guttural French is a hawking traitor. His quick wolof is a restless warrior. His slow, impeccable syllables, a gentleman traitor. He tells in their own language what they have done. Our touring maps and cameras ready. We stand in the weighing room where chained men paraded firm backs, their women open, full breasts, and children, rows of shiny teeth. Others watch from the balcony, set a price in guilders, francs, pestas, and English pounds. Later, when he has finished, we too can leave our coins where the stiff legs dragged in endless bargain. He shows us how some sat knee bent in the first room, young virgins waited in the second, in the third already read the sick and dying gathered near the exit to see. In the weighing room again, he takes a chain to show us how it's done. We take photographs to remember. No one speaks except the iron on stone and the sea where nothing's safe. He smiles for he has spoken of ancestors, his, Hours, we leave quietly, each alone, knowing that they who come after us and breaking in these tides will find red, empty rooms to measure long journeys. All right, now I'm seeing some uh, questions in the chat. So uh, Lala, Lala says, I'm interested in your literary heritage. You write about family in Africa. Can you talk about how you know, Ghanaian, Gambian literary influence? Definitely. Um, Ghanaian influence, I will have to say uh, Kofi Anwar, who is like, he was an Ewe poet from uh, from Ghana, now Efua Ansong, who's like a, a more contemporary poet, I read a lot of her work, um, also Ya JC, who's a novelist from Ghana, I'm really inspired by, by her, uh, in Gambia, um, not as many direct poetic influences, more so the griot tra um, tradition, which is basically Gambia's form of like oral storytellers. And I feel like a lot of my poetry tries to keep stories alive um, and is very much based on like, oh, family history. Let's see. And if not, I can keep reading poems too. Ah, research process. Yeah, that, um, that, that, that took a while because sadly there isn't much uh, that's always available. Um, I really source a lot of my uh, material from this website called blackpast.org, which does a really good job of giving a lot of stunning details um, to the people's lives who were killed by police. Um, and I think that websites like that do a lot of the work that we need, you know, because I think this year I was really touched when um, people started celebrating Breonna Taylor's birthday, right? Because I feel like so much of the narrative centers on um, the occurrence of death, which I think is very powerful, very important for us to remember, like the unjust ways that people sometimes are murdered in this country for the color of, of their skin. But I think it's also equally important for us to remember the vibrancy of, of, of their lives and something like celebrating someone's birthday, I think is really important in like doing that. So yeah, most of it was, was like sourced from uh, blackpast.org. Uh, I ordered, uh, there was one, 
book that I used for a different elegy about um, Freddie Gray called Baltimore um, Uprising, which uh, was an amazing book that was written by one of by someone who knew Freddie, who was a photojournalist. So it's like a, a, it basically tells Freddie's story as well as the story of the uprisings through photographs and essays. Thank you for that question, Jordan. Yeah, eco -conscious. I've been writing a lot more because um, climate change obviously is impacting us here in the US, but sadly, like research shows that it's also gonna be really impacting places like West Africa and South Asia, like the hardest. And we're seeing that with like famines, we're seeing that with like overfishing, we're seeing that with, with, with droughts. And I think that it's really interesting because so much of, I guess, um, culture is based on like how people are able to sustain themselves, right? So like certain fishing, like s certain aspects of Ghanaian culture will be, will be impacted by the fact that people fish, you know? So I feel like um, when I wrote the poem about saltwater demanding a psalm, like it was less about someone losing their way of life, but like also losing a deeply impactful aspect of their culture, uh, which I think is like the two edged sword that uh, unfortunately plagues a lot of uh, people in West Africa. Thank you for that question as well. Feel free to send questions. Oh, I think one of the questions was like, what am I reading right now? I answered that, but a poem a book of poems that I recommend, I recommend two right now, uh, Homie by Danez Smith, which I think is just like a stunning and tender uh, meditation on like mourning and joy. And I think that's kind of what my poetry tries to do sometime. And uh, basically I have a friend, um, a coast, who's also a poet uh, who graduated from my program, who basically says that like mourning and joy aren't opposites, but like they're on a continuum. And I think that's a really like stunning way uh, to sort of like experience those emotions. And I think that that's something that I want to cha uh, channel in, in my work as well. So if anyone wants to read some really good poems, uh, check out Homie by Dines Smith. And Mary Henson uh, asks, I'd like to know more about your grandfather's influence on, as a poet on me. Yeah, definitely like um, we would talk about poems, we trade poems. Uh, he was really big on like West African poetry. So I actually bought an anthology of West African poems that like, and that's like really inspired my, uh, my work. But I feel like his biggest influence was a lot of like of the stories, you know, I feel like he would always have a lot of really, you know, um, unique stories to tell about his own upbringing and his childhood uh, in, in, in ways that were never written down. But I think that like um, my motivation for writing oftentimes comes to keep a record, you know, of those stories. Cause like, wow, the oral tradition is beautiful and like extends throughout like West Africa and, and, and um, other um, regions and locations and cultures. Um, it's difficult sometimes like when the people who carry those stories leave us, you know, like who is, 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 is left to keep those memories alive. So I think that's the biggest thing that influences me or his biggest influence on me was to really just like want to record those stories of family and those stories of uh, place and those stories of West African history as well. Uh, thank you, Mary, for that question. And we have uh, Jody has a question. Says that I felt an emotional relationship with uh, water and salt water demands a song. Also, with even fish being fished and are respectful, and it was beautiful. Oh, thank you so much, Jody. Yeah, like that's something that um, yeah, like a lot of the culture along Ghana's coast is really influenced by fishing and a lot of the diet as well. So that also um, inspired that that poem. Yeah, that's something that's really interesting because I feel like because I was born in Gambia and like I've lived in, in the U.S., so much of my identity was like also learning how to be black, you know, because like there's like obviously differences in like African culture versus West African culture. But I think that being like, the biggest thing for me is that being in school, kind of like being in like the university space, like I was able to see those aspects of diaspora like meld in really cool ways. Like we have like the organization of African students and we have the Caribbean students organization and we have like the like bigger like Pan-African student association. So all of those things really like help me see the vibrancy like within blackness and also to see like, especially now with like, like my generation that's like heavily on, on social media, like trends are able to like transfer so much quicker, you know, which I think is really cool to see, which is like 
something that inspires like even like the like dancing poems and stuff like people people like dances that come from Africa are easily like replicated here in the U.S. and vice versa because people will share something and boom, um, that's like like it's just like instantaneous, which I think is really cool. And I have I have not written a poem yet about Elmina, even though I visited Elmina like four years ago when I was last in in Ghana. Um, I think I've written prose about it, but not yet a poem. And I think it's something that will be difficult to write, but definitely a goal that I have because like that memory is very haunting and, 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 and very moving as well. Um, J Jody has a question. Do you wrestle with how vulnerable to be in poems? What do you feel pretty comfortable expressing yourself in poetry? Yeah, I definitely wrestle with it. Like that's what, like, especially the, the elegies that I read. This was the first time I've ever read those publicly. And it took me a while to practice them and also to <clears throat> to feel comfortable because like oftentimes like when I would write them it would be incredibly heavy. So I think that what what keeps me going is the like is this ethos of like memory and also like focusing on the life. I feel like that's like what like the, the poems try to do is to focus on sustaining the positive aspects of the life. And I feel like that sense of joy and that resilience is what makes it easier for uh, me to share those those, uh, those poems at times. I'm loving these these questions. Thank you folks. And also shout out to Furious Flower. Yes, there's an event April 30th about ancestors and inheritances. Also here is the anthology, which is really cool. And shout out to my aunt for getting me this for Christmas. But yeah. Yeah, thank you, Ifwat. Um, basically, it's really funny because I, I joke and tell people like I'm like a West African gumbo, because like on my mom's side it's all from Ghana, but like my dad, he's from Sierra Leone, but his parents are from Sierra Leone and Gambia, so it's just like it's just cool to see a lot of the similarities across like you know Gambian and Ghanaian culture, and I think that it just gives I feel like it just gives you like it, for me personally like, it gives me like like more roots like I can like for the um, elegies like that was inspired a lot from like my mom's culture and then like some of the poems about Gambia obviously were inspired from my dad's culture and even the attention to orality and like the, the griot tradition that's like inspired by my dad's culture as well so it's just like it just like gives you it gives me like more roots like when I am a blend of uh, West Africa and yes I do teach I teach uh, well yeah because I'm, I'm a master student here I teach two classes each semester and that's a big question whether my pedagogy, I don't think I have like a teaching, like a solid pedagogy yet. I think that some of my like influences or some of my ethos in, like in teaching is kind of similar like with my, uh, with my uh, poems. I've tried to center like uh, West African and like and black diaspora theory, scholars, intellect, because like so much of that is like sort of like swept under the rug in academia. So I feel like, yeah, last semester I, I taught, like I had to teach a class on compositional writing and uh, rhetoric but like I tried as much as possible to like bring in you know discourse by like black writers so that these students would be exposed to that so I think that for a kind of like anti-racist pedagogy is the closest thing that I think uh, describes my own pedagogy but teaching has been fun uh, I teach both at the University of Michigan and for a nonprofit um, literary um, group in Detroit called Inside Out and basically for that I teach creative writing and language arts to uh, middle school and high school students in Detroit and that is once a week and Inside Out is amazing if you haven't heard of them they're in Detroit and they do amazing work and they give people the opportunity to publish the, uh, like they give these students the opportunity to publish their their writing after they they go through the program so shout out to them I think we have like 12 ish more minutes exactly decolonize this curriculum I'm here for more questions, here for more poems, maybe some more dancing, who knows? I'm chilling. Wow, yeah, like Sierra Leone is, is, is like the space that I think is so interesting because of its history of like um, freed slaves from the Americas coming back. I feel like that's something that I really want to write about as well that I haven't quite gotten to yet. Oh, yeah, um, for for um, the middle schoolers, it's like 
they, the, I feel like they write a lot about the pandemic because like I teach virtually to, with them, which is hard to keep them engaged sometimes. Like with high school students, it's a lot easier. But with middle schoolers, I feel like they come writing a lot about the pandemic, a lot about video games. I, was, I have a lot of guys in the class who write about that. So that's interesting. Um, but I feel like it's, it's, it's cool. Like I definitely want them to bring their, their full selves to like our English class. So whatever it is like on their mind, like we try to center that as like something that is worthy of being written about, worthy of being um, interrogated. And dance demo. What, what dance can I do? That because like my my camera right now, I don't think I can move it too much, but mm, I think, yeah, I'll just do like this little one that we did, like one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, just little, this little seated dance. <laughs> That's a really interesting question. Uh, the effect of the pandemic, I know that Gambia um, is, cases are starting to rise in Gambia. And I know that it's a lot harder for people to social distance because of how much sort of open air spaces and market culture uh, is like part and process of people like everyday life. So um, I know the cases are starting to rise. I know it's, thankfully the, the um, ratio is not anywhere near as bad as, as, as the US. I know that Ghana has had a more favorable response. Um, they can now have more vaccines. And I know that even at the height, um, people were able to recover quickly um, um, uh, from, from, uh, from COVID um, during the, the time. So I feel like that's good, but it's very unsettling to like this level of uncertainty with all the new variants and stuff. So definitely my thoughts and, and prayers are with those uh, back home because sadly, you know, the, the privileged Western countries are the ones with access to the vaccine and they oftentimes leave countries in the global south uh, kind of get the second and third rounds of the doses after Europe and America gets it. Do I speak or write fluently in any other languages? Sadly, no, at least not yet. Um, a couple summers ago, my mom was teaching me tree, so I think I need to go back and learn some tree so I can write more. But whenever I would have a question, I would ask, oh, like, what does this mean? Like, what does that mean? And I would use that for like my like research or like my poetry, but I really want to learn how to write in tree. Uh, I guess I speak Creole, which is like um, Sierra Leone's sort of like lingua franca. And I can write in Creole. I don't write as well because I, I, like, I don't practice it um, as fluently. But I think it's, it's like really fun to see all of the um, West African literary festivals that like aren't in English, especially like in like Nigeria, they have like Yoruba literary, Yoruba literary festivals, like Hausa literary festivals. I, I feel like that's like what we need because so many of these languages are not dying because the speakers, but are dying because few, like few and few people are able to write in them, which I think is something that like we need to center when we think about Black and African poetry. Like, how can we keep these languages alive on the page as well? So, thank you for that question, Ifwa. We got a couple more minutes. I think I might read another poem as we did from the Figures Flower Anthology. Let's see if I can find a lot of these are long. The Card Tables, Jericho Brown. Stop playing. Do you remember the card tables? Slick stick figures like men with low cut fades, short but standing straight because we bent them into weak display. What didn't we want? What wouldn't we claim? How perfectly each surface was made for throwing or dropping or slamming a necessary portion of our pay. How could any of us get by with one in the way? Didn't that bear squeak ask to be played? Beaten on the head, then folded, then put away? All so we could call ourselves safe, now that there was no now that there was more room. 
a little more space. All right, we got six more minutes. If you got questions, send them over. Oh, of course, I yeah. This is like this book has been one of my favorites <laughs> to read. I'm almost almost all the way through it, but since like Christmas, I've been working through it. Let's see what other poems I can read. <clears throat> Actually, no. Let me read some Lucille Clifton. This is a poem that inspired. Um, Yeah, this is a poem that inspires my writing as well. There we go. This is um, At the Cemetery, Walnut Grove Plantation, South Carolina, 1989, by Lucille Clifton. At the Cemetery, Walnut Grove, 1989. Among the rocks at Walnut Grove, your silence drumming in my bones, tell me your names. Nobody mentions slaves, and yet the curious tools shine with your fingerprints. Nobody mentions slaves, but somebody did this work who had no guide, no stone, who molders under rock. Tell me your names. Tell me your bashful names, and I will testify. The inventory lists 10 slaves, but only men will recognize. Among the rocks at Walnut Grove, some of these honored dead were dark. Some of these dark were slaves. Some of these slaves were women. Some of them did dishonored work. Tell me your names, foremothers, brothers. Tell me your dishonored names. Here lies, here lies, here lies, here lies, here. And again, that was a poem by Lucille Clifton. Writing process, I feel like nowadays, uh, definitely in the morning, uh, a lot of prompts, but it's mostly been like research-based. Like I usually have a research question that I'm looking for, and then the poetry kind of goes from there. But also I like going to the museum, especially Black History Museum. Shout out, shout out to the one in DC, especially the one here in Detroit as well. The Charles H. Wright is really, really cool. So last time I went a couple weeks ago, like just like huge exhibits and I'll like write down notes and then that's kind of how the poem comes from there. Um, revision, same thing, like I, like my professors give, give me a bunch of like prompts to like, to like uh, use in the revision process. Most of them like, oh, like change the tense of verbs uh, or uh, stuff like reorder the stanzas or like delete everything except for the last line and then go from there. Like all these prompts I think have been really helpful and especially in the revision because I believe like there is, like my first draft, so it was usually very bad. So it's like, it's really all about um, the uh, second and, and like third drafts. And I think that, yeah, just being in the master's program has given me kind of space and time to experiment with different things. So that's been really fun too. Uh, thank you so much for coming, Jody. And yeah, it's like a pleasure to share my work and the work of two amazing poets as well. Just like that, the hour is almost done. It was so quick. I feel like I, feel like I just got here. Ah, research question. Um, some of the research questions that I've been interrogating have been, what does police brutality look like um, in a place where race doesn't matter? You know, like what is, cause like, I feel like it was it for in, like in the US, um, it's really easy to see that dynamic between like, oh, people of color and like police, but like, what does it mean? Like in other countries, like I'm thinking about Jamaica, even places in like West Africa where like police brutality is a huge problem. Even in, in Nigeria, like there was the whole end, like end SARS movement. And like now, like I, I'm like, my research is like turning towards like, how do we talk about like racism and structural racism and systems of control within like West African spaces? Cause in those spaces, it's less about race and more about um, your socioeconomic status or sort of like proximity to the government and what does it mean like when your oppressor shares your own skin so i feel like those are the type of those are the type of um questions that like i'm interrogating now 
And uh, my thesis, like undergrad and my current thesis, um, basically interrogate the linkages between um, West African forms of literature and literature of like the Black Arts Movement and the Harlem Renaissance. And um, yeah, uh, I basically trace both of those. I basically trace the modalities of those movements, of those movements, like these like Western, Western or like Black American movements and like try to like link them to certain uh, practices that are, that are still um, there are practices in West Africa as well. And that is just about time. Thank you everyone for the questions. I wish I could, you know, celebrate with, with you all, but it's probably not a joy sharing my And to Furious Flower for holding this event. And don't forget, next week uh, we're coming with uh, another amazing reading by Glennis Redman, April 16th at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. Same link. And for more information about this and other programs, please follow Furious Flower on social media or visit the, the website jmu.edu slash furiousflower. And again, thank you to the National Endowment of the Arts for supporting this event. And thank you all for joining me for this reading series. Uh, take it easy and have a great rest of your day. Thank you. I'm going to end the live video now. <laughs>